Okay, so um, I still need to give back to you your um, mechanical advantage stuff. Um, and you've done some graphs for me. I need to um, give those back to you. And I also need to show you uh, how a more effective way to present those data to make a point. Uh, let's see, you also um, should uh, have finished, uh, I know a couple of you have not, uh, you're still working on it, but you should have finished the uh, MorphoJ stuff with uh, uh, looking at the relationship between uh, shape and uh, mechanical advantage. There we go. Uh, so, um, if there are any questions about that, just catch me right after uh, class and take care of it. Anybody else have a quick question before we get started? Yeah. Well, we have a test. Oh, good, good point. When do you want an exam? Never. I, I'm good with that. I, you know, I'll just make up grades, whatever you know I feel like at the moment. If it's a shitty morning, then you're all screwed. But if it's an awesome morning, it'll be great. What do you think? Take my chances. Take care. <laughs> you don't know me very well. <laughs> uh, uh, we should probably have a have a quiz, um, a small exam. Uh, the exam will be online, okay? Uh, so uh, I'm doing one for my general ecology course that I'm going to put up on Friday night, and I'll have the weekend to do it. Uh, the way it works is there'll be a link on the web page. You click on the link, um, and then the exam comes up. Uh, you fill it out, and then click Submit, and it's uh, right away gets transmitted. Um, to me be a spreadsheet. Uh, every time you do that, it's time stamped, uh, and there will be a time limit on it. So once your time has passed, then it, uh, it's not going to record answers anymore, or I can ignore the answers from that point on. Um, it will be geo-stamped, so I know where you are when you take the exam uh, down to street, okay, not actual street address. Um, so time, location stamp, plus I get your IP address, so that way I know uh, who you are. Um, I'm not weird. I'm not going to stalk you or anything of that sort. Um, but uh, that's just there to make sure that you know there aren't like five of you all on five different laptops sitting in the same cafe doing this whole thing together. You know, and just trading answers back and forth. Uh, so uh, that's the objective for that. The date. Yeah, that's a story for another time. Um, Remind me at some point to tell you about grades and wired grads from uh, an interesting sort of phenomenon. Um, so yeah, uh, when you want it, uh, I prefer not to do it this weekend, maybe first part of the week or something like that. October something. October something? Yeah. End of October? Start of December? No, like mid-October. <laughs> 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 mid so you want it mid-October? Would that be like a midterm kind of? Yeah, I mean, we can do a lot of these things. We can do only one of them. I don't care. We can do just one exam. When, when I was a student uh, in uh, statistics at New Mexico, um, you did homework, but they never collected it and never graded it. Um, and there were no midterm exams. There were no quizzes. Your entire grade was based on the final exam. So you went in there um, to do the final exam. And you could smell the fear when you went in there. It was pretty impressive. Um, so if you were the sort of student that, you know, was just fanatical about homework and reading and working problems and making sure you knew how to do all this stuff, if you were that type of student, you skated. It was easy. If you weren't that kind of student, you sucked eggs. Okay. So it, it was pretty. It was pretty awesome. It was pretty cool. You learned a lot about strategies for for learning and testing and taking exams and things of that sort. Uh, so we can do two exams. We can do three. We can do four. Whatever you like. They just get smaller. I get, I yeah. Yeah. I mean, the amount of material we cover doesn't change. Okay. 
you want to wait until the middle of, uh, or first of October, something like that, first of the month, and do it and see how it goes. Then you can decide to have another one if you didn't do well, and we'll squeeze another one in there somewhere. Yeah. Beginning of October. Beginning, beginning of October, right, right before my birthday, right before I get truly old and gimpy. Right before they call the GIMP police and escort me out of here in a straitjacket and ketamine and all that other good stuff. Kind of you soul, whatever else. <laughs> okay. Uh, more about that. There are, by the way, old exams on the web page, so you should you should look at those and uh, get a sense of uh, what's happening. All right. Let's uh, let's start talking then um, about. Um, the evolution uh, about more of the evolution of vertebrates. What we did last time uh, was we talked about um, where the vertebrates come from, uh, and we made the point that the vertebrates are derived from uh, the echinoderms, uh, and we evaluated those three hypotheses. Uh, and the point that we made, the reason we know that uh, that vertebrates come from the echinoderms is that is that they are um, deuterostomes and that they have enterocelous siloam formation. Everybody else is a protostome, okay? Um, so, and everybody else has schistocelous siloam formation. And uh, I know echinoderms don't sound like the obvious ancestor to the vertebrates, but the larval stages are bilaterally symmetric, just like we are. The larval stages do have. Um, uh, a noto well, they do have sort of a proto notochord, right? They do have seg segmentation and all that kind of stuff. They are on that lineage that gives rise to, to us. Okay, so uh, the next stage that comes up are the fishes, and I don't want to talk about the fishes very much other than to make the point uh, that there are a couple of uh, groups of fishes. There are the ray finned fishes, and then there are the lobe. Finned fishes. The ray finned fishes are the actinopterygians. Uh, so that includes all of the things like uh, tuna and um, and carp and uh, you know all that gobies and all of that kind of stuff. So all of basically modern fishes. And then there are the ancient fishes, which are the lobe finned fishes, and those are the sarcopterygians. There were actually a couple of groups of lobe finned fishes. Uh, one group of lobe finned fishes. If you looked at their lobes, they have one element up here in the, in the uh, proximal uh, appendage, both anterior and posterior, and they have two elements distally, just like us, right? And then in the group that we come from, from the crossopterygian fishes, they have five elements most distally, five anterior and five posterior, and that's what we have. There was another group of of uh, sarcopterygian fishes that had one, two, and eight. And that lineage went extinct. So we're derived from the lineage that had five. The group that had eight is gone. Okay? And that's why all vertebrates have five fingers and five toes, at least embryonically. Horses embryonically have five. Cows embryonically have five. Right? Everybody has five, it's the magic number. That's why we have the metric system, because it's easy to count to ten. Okay? It works. Imagine if we had come from the other group and our number system was based on eights. That would be just a little bit confusing. Okay? Then it would be like in a computer, right? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, right? 128, 256, 512. Those numbers sound familiar? Yeah, that's, well, or, or kilobytes, yeah. or way back when, bytes, okay, so yeah. All right, so here we have these two lineages of fishes, and we come from the cross cross-opterygians that are lobe-finned and are um, basically walking along the bottom. So an interesting thing happens, right, in the evolution of these guys, and that is um, that these cross um are the group that is responsible for the transition to land. So they are already positioned in a way that they are able to walk across the bottom. And now what you have is the evolution of a group, which is going to make that transition just a little bit more complete. 
and actually go from being in the water to being up on land at least part of the time. Okay? And the group that does that are the amphibians. Now, all of this is taking place before the Permian, so we're talking about the Devonian and the Silurian per periods. So think to yourself, what was the world like back in the Devonian and the Silurian? It was mostly water, wasn't it? Like, well, it's still mostly water. Well, I mean, like, but there wasn't much land. It was a warm, shallow sea. Well, there were areas where the, the seas were were shallow, right? But what in what position were all of the continents? Okay. No, Pangaea has not yet formed. Okay, so the continents are all separate, but they are slowly moving together on a collision course. Okay? So the fact that the continents aren't yet all together in one place means that there is a lot of coastline. Once all of the continents are together, the amount of coastline relative to inland area is less. When all of the continents are separate, the amount of coastline relative to land area is much higher. That's important because evolution is a stochastic process. And when all of the continents are well separated, what that means is there's a lot of coastline, so the probability that some organisms are going to be able to navigate that, that coast, that interface, and make it onto land is much higher. If all the continents were together, the relative amount of coastline would be less, so the probability of that transition would be lower. All right? So it's a stochastic process. Just like buying a lottery ticket. The probability of, of winning the lottery is always the same. But you buy two tickets, you've doubled your chance of being a winner. You buy four tickets, you've quadrupled your chance of being a winner. Okay? The probability of winning is still infinitesimally small, but hey, ultimately somebody wins. And that's what happened to the amphibians, right? So by having all this surface, all this coastal lineage, right, this, this coastal coastline, the probability that they're going to be a winner goes up. Okay, so now let's think about what's on land. On the land that is available, what is on the land? Plants. What are the plants like? Trees, palm trees. No, I don't think those are all shrubby. Shrubs, you think? Maybe. Yeah. Well, what do the earliest plants look like? Because trees had not yet evolved. Stems had not yet evolved. I mean, stems, yeah, have evolved, but not of the sort that you find in bushes and shrubs and trees. In other words, the sort of vertical component wasn't there. So the plants that you would have had, the diversity would have been relatively low, right? Not a lot of botanical diversity, and it would have been pretty basic plant structure, not the sort of stuff that you see today. So now you ask yourself, why would these amphibians make the transition from being fully aquatic to spending some of their life on land? What's the draw? What do they gain by coming out on land? And importantly, what do they have to do in order to survive on land? Why do they come out on land in the first place? Ultimately, there's less competition. More from what? Sizes. Who are they competing with? Whatever's in the water. So uh, other guys just like them? Well, so here you are in Cape Girardeau and you're competing with all the other residents of Cape Girardeau. Why don't you leave, man? Oh, I plan to. <laughs> <laughs> but amphibians didn't have that. So sort you're of smarter forward. than me. I got <laughs> I'm stuck. Amphibians didn't have that sort of forward thinking. But that, that I digress. Um, probably like fish and so everybody likes to use the competition argument. 
right? The difficulty is when you try and demonstrate experimentally that competition is real, it's almost impossible to do. Okay? We know that competition works under some circumstances, like in business. Okay? And all of our models for competition come from business. Right? And in laboratory experiments, we can demonstrate that competition works. But in nature, trying to demonstrate that it works is impossible. And the reason for that is, is that, number one, it's almost impossible to identify what the limiting resource is. And number two, nature is so variable and so unpredictable that you can't get the kind of conditions you need long enough for really competition to work. So the people that use competition as the answer for everything are just like the Bible thumpers that use God as their answer for everything. You know, why are we having this pandemic? It's God's will. Okay? That sort of stuff. So then resource availability? Maybe. It's hard, to, it's hard to imagine that some amphibian is going, God damn, you know, there's not a lot to eat around here. I think I'll get out of the water and try some of this shit, man. It's hard, it's hard to imagine that, right? So it's an interesting question, and I'm not sure that we have the ability to answer it. It might be that those animals that were getting out onto land a little bit were escaping predation. Maybe there was some kind of resource available out there that they could exploit. It's hard to understand, right? It's, it's, we don't understand that transition hardly at all. Somebody's got to say it. Aliens. Run that by me again? Aliens. Aliens, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, there it is. Okay, so let's think then mechanically about what has to happen in order for a, an amphibian, in order for this earliest amphibian-like vertebrate to come out on the land. Uh, and what we do know about amphibians is that they all have a two-phase life history. Right? So the life cycle is broken up into two parts. There's a juvenile part and an adult part. Okay? And the juvenile part is fundamentally different from the adult. So the juvenile part um, is usually aquatic and pre-swimming. The adult part is usually more divorced from water. And that brings up this idea, which you've probably heard, um, that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. How many of you have heard that phrase before, that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny? You, nobody's heard that before? I need to have a word with young Tim Judd. That idea dates back to the 1800s. And that idea, the, if you look at a human embryo, for example, if you look at embryonic development, right, for a human or a chicken or a lizard or a horse or whatever, you look at this thing, very early on, it looks just like a ball, like every other animal out there. Then it starts to look a little bit like a fish. And then it looks a little bit like an amphibian. And then it looks a little bit like a reptile. And then it looks a little bit like something else, until finally it looks more like a monkey and finally it looks like a human fetus, okay? So essentially what you're doing, if you, if you think about evolution in that progressive way, right, that ladder of life, and we've poo-pooed all of that, right? But if you think about it in that way, then you look at the ontogeny, the embryological development to this fetus, and it's basically repeating or recapitulating, reviewing, the phylogenetic history. That's, that, that's what that idea says. So you're going through, in your embryonic development, it looks like you are going through all of these evolutionary changes. You're recapitulating your evolutionary history as you develop. The idea is nice. The idea is bullshit. Okay. 
And that was demonstrated by Stephen Jay Gould in his PhD dissertation. Okay? And he wrote a book called Ontogeny and Phylogeny, which is which is an extension of his PhD dissertation. If you ever find it on Amazon or at a used bookstore, I recommend you buy it because it is a phenomenal piece of work. Okay? But in general, right, that remains the same. If you think about the larval form of an amphibian, it basically looks like a fish. And only then does it develop the limbs and the stuff that it needs to move out on land. In the embryonic form, it has gills, until ultimately it loses the gills and has lungs. All right? Something weird is happening here. There we go. OK. So in amphibians, they have this two-phase life history. Um, there's usually this free-living aquatic developmental stage, and then there's the terrestrial, um, juvenile, and adult stage. Um, so that represents the transition from water um, to land, just as you would expect. Now, one problem that you face when you become terrestrial um, is this. We've already talked about the two most important things in life. What are they? I know, I know we've had that discussion. What are the two most important things in life? What are the two most important things in your life? I mean, I'm not saying right now at this very moment. Reproduce. Reproduction and food. food. Okay? So let's think about the reproduction part of it. Now you're terrestrial and you're going to reproduce. Exactly how is that going to work? How do fish do it? Uh, Excepting sharks, okay? Forget about sharks. Sharks are highly derived. How do fish reproduce? Well, she doesn't really lay them. She just sort of pops them out. They're floating down in the water a little bit. Then the male goes, oh, goody. And he deposits all of his sperm. And the sperm are floating, swimming around, right? Bumping into these free-floating eggs. And then you have it, okay? I know some fish really do lay their eggs, okay? And then the male deposits the sperm right on top. I know, okay? How are you gonna do that on land? You're not. You're not, right? Because if you just deposit these eggs on a rock or a leaf or something like that, there were no leaves, right? You deposit your, in the mud or on the dirt, they're gonna dry out they're no longer viable. So they have to have some way of figuring this out. And in fact, they do. And as an example, you can see what happens in Sicilians. Here's a, a sagittal section through the cloaca of, or this is a female salamander, the same situation applies in Sicilians. Um, so here's a female salamander, here's the cloaca, so they're their uro urinogenital opening, they have only one urinogenital opening, okay? So all their body waste goes through that one opening. They don't have a separate urethra and danus. Everything dumps into the same opening to the outside, and that opening is called the cloaca. And what that means is that all the reproductive material is going through that same opening. So here's the cloaca, and here's the structure called the spermatheca. The spermatheca is the device used by the salamander to do what? This is a female. Why would she have a little organ called a spermatheca? It's used to store sperm. For, to store sperm, which is important. Okay? So she's going to store sperm in there, and she's going to use those sperm to fertilize her eggs. In other words, what the male had to do in some way was get those sperm inside the female. So how do you do that? To, to buy what? Because don't they have to ingest something? Oh man, you've been living in Missouri too long. <laughs> It's, I used to go down 
when I when I first got here, I would be down in the boot hill a lot, you know, doing a lot of uh, work for MDC and whatnot. And you'd go into these little cafes, and there'd always be some guy there that would figure out that you know you were working on trapping or something like that. And there'd be some good old boy come up to you and say, "Hey, uh, know about those possums?" And first of all, there are no possums in Missouri. We have opossums. All the possums on the planet are in Australia, New Guinea, and New Zealand. Okay? We have opossums. And this guy says, I say, yeah, I, I know about them. You know how they fuck? I go, uh, well, I've, I've never watched them, but I, I think I understand the basic concept of how this works. Okay? And he goes, they do it through the nose. <laughs> Why would he think that? Because they have two nares, right? So two openings for the nostrils. And if you look at the penis on these guys, it's bifurcated. So this guy's looking at this opossum, and he sees this penis, and it's got two ends on it like that. And the only place on this animal where he sees two openings is the nose. So this male opossum is going to mount the head of this female, jam his penis up into her nostrils, and then ejaculate. Okay, good. I, you know, we're up to that point. Okay. Um, and then what happens to the sperm? I guess it goes down into the lungs and gets absorbed in the bloodstream and somehow makes it down to the ovaries or down to the uterus or something. How would that work? It doesn't. it doesn't. If you look at the vagina on opossums, it's also bipartite. So you have the entrance to the vagina, but then it right away splits into two parts. So one part of the penis goes into one vaginal canal, the other part, the other part goes into the other vaginal canal. Any other animals do something like that? Oh hell yeah. Snakes and lizards. They have hemipenes, they have two of them, but they only use one at a time, okay? And they do that because they're either going to line up on the right-hand side of the female or the left-hand side, depending on which side they line up on, that's the one they're going to use, okay? All right, so there you are. You're a male, you're a male salamander, and you desperately want to get more sperm into this female. How are you going to do this? The problem is, you don't have an intermittent organ. You don't have a penis. So what are your options? Mate water. Yeah, but then, so if she deposits her eggs in the water, then why would she have a spermatheca? Well, I'm thinking maybe the sperm gets And the sperm, the sperm swims out, finds an egg, oh, I like this one, grabs it. Swims back up into the cloaca, stuffs itself in the spermatheca. I like that idea. Sounds like a, a cartoon. You know, <laughs> special episode of Ren and Stimpy or something. You know? Well? How do birds do it? Do birds have penises? Yeah, dogs, but let's not talk about dogs. Let's talk about <laughs> songbirds. How do they do it? You've never watched birds have sex? Well, I know like eagles battle and owls. Like, like yeah, I'm not talking about the foreplay and all that <laughs> good stuff. I mean the actual, the old wham bam thank you man moment. That's what I'm talking about. They do something called a cloacal kiss. So they both fly up like this, and they take their cloacas, and they go like that, and they're done. That's all it is. And they fly off, they're finished. And the male has just put his sperm inside the cloaca of the female. That's all there is to it. 
It's none of this, you know, lounging around, going at it for a couple of hours or something, smoking a cigarette afterwards, none of that sort of stuff, okay? It really is wham bam, and we're done, and we're out of here, okay? What these guys do in some salamanders, what the male will do is he'll build a little proteinaceous mound, and on top of the mound, he'll deposit a packet of sperm. So in the little stream or in this little puddle, he's going to build this mound. He's going to put a per sperm packet right on top. And then he's going to go find the female, and he's going to do this dance in front of the female. And he's going to try and make the dance super hot, get her little motor running, and convince her to come and, and park her cloaca right on top of this, this proteinaceous mound and sort of sit on it and insert the sperm packet right inside her cloaca. How cool is that? Little salamander males doing dances, trying to get the little females all excited and stuff, so that they'll sit on top of this little proteinaceous mound to pick up a sperm packet. What could be sexier? I mean, really, these little guys are all turned on and everything, it would be great. That's one of the strategies that they use. It turns out, that in the evolution of frogs, frogs, most frogs, have sex only when there's water available. And if you look at the evolution of frogs, it's real interesting how they go about doing this. In the oldest frogs, what happens is the, the female is there, the male comes up behind her, and he, with his front arms, he grabs her right in front of her back legs. And that's called inguinal amplexus. So he's got his front arms right around her waist, and she's going to deposit her eggs, and then he's going to put his sperm right on top of the eggs, and then there's going to be this gelatinous coating that goes over everything to keep it in a nice protected mass, and it's going to float in the water attached to some reed or something like that. The more advanced amphibians, instead of using inguinal amplexus, the male will use axillary amplexus. So he's going to grab her, not right around the waist, but right under her armpits. And now his cloaca is closer to her cloaca. So they're reducing the distance between their cloacas. And then they do the same thing. And the most advanced form are these guys that use cephalic amplexes. So the male, instead of grabbing her around the armpits, grabs her around the head. And now his sperm are right there where her cloaca is, and there's no chance of wasting eggs or wasting sperm. All right, the point is, in some way, you have to get fertilization of the eggs. Salamanders will use these proteinaceous mounds, and the females will pick it up. Frogs, they're going to use amplexus. Sacilians have this structure that looks like this. You ready? Hey, that's called the phallodium, okay? So that's the intromittent, not intermittent. Intermittent is what gimpy old geezer guys have, okay? Intromittent means it works just fine, thank you, all right? It's the intermittent organ, the copulatory organ of a Sicilian. What are Sicilians? There are this group of amphibians which are fossorial, so they don't live on the surface, they live underground in little tunnels, they don't have arms or legs, they don't have eyes that break the surface, okay? and they burrow through the dirt. So they're not exposed to water, so they have to have internal fertilization, and in fact they do it with this structure, which is nothing more than a modified portion of the cloacal wall. All right, now, fine, that's the reproduction part of it. Now, here you are, you've made the transition from water to land. In the juvenile stage, you can have gills, and now you're on land, okay? So you're not in the water all the time. How are you going to breathe? Somehow, you have to get oxygen. How are you going to do that? 
Yeah, okay, so uh, what do those lungs look like? Do, do plethodontid salamanders have lungs? They don't, but they've lost them secondarily. Okay, so they would have had lungs. Yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, never mind. It says up there. Yeah, servitary to volume ratios. What's that all about? Uh, like we discussed previously with uh, heat, uh, you know, there's only so much that you, there's only a certain size that you can support um, until you just don't get enough of what you need. That's right. So here's somebody who's skinny, and here's somebody the hands out there or something like that. There's somebody that's same height. All right, I didn't draw them quite to scale, okay? <laughs> but this one is going to have a high surface area to volume ratio. That one is going to have a low surface area to volume ratio, okay? And what that means is heat exchange with the environment is going to be high here. Heat exchange is low here because the amount of surface area of skin you have relative to body volume is small compared to this. The same applies to gas exchange. So all amphibians have wet skin. Their skin is wet so that you can have gas exchange. If your skin is dry, you won't exchange gas. The skin has to be wet. Is that okay. also why their skin is thinner? Their skin is thin so that the oxygen and the CO2 don't have to go very far to get into the circulation. Okay. So they have thin skin and it's wet. So the oxygen and the carbon dioxide have to go into solution before they can go across the membrane. So now the question is, why are amphibians so small? The answer is they're small so that they can have high surface area to volume ratios so that they can breathe through the skin. And they do breathe through the skin. But some also have lungs. Where do the lungs come from? Well, there are these things called lung fishes. What are the lungs in lung fishes? What else? How many people here like to go fishing? All right, you caught some nice bass or crappy or something, and you're going to clean it. Get your knife out, cut him open. What do you pop out? The guts, what else comes popping out? Right, the stomach, the intestines, the liver, spleen, pancreas, all that stuff. You get that out with your thumb. What else is up in there, up at the top? Swim bladder, right? What's the swim bladder all about? What is the what is the swim bladder? They use it to uh, like put that stuff there. That's right. If they use it, they adjust the gas, the gases that are in there to determine where they're going to be in the water column. Okay? So it is a site of gas exchange. It's filled with gas. Okay? The only problem with a swim bladder is it comes off, right, dorsally, and your lungs come off ventrally. So in the evolution of lungs, right, first of all, you have to go from having one swim bladder to having paired swim bladders, and instead of coming off dorsally, they have to come off ventrally. But we think that, the sw that lungs are nothing more than modified swim bladders. Great. So now you have these amphibians that are able to breathe through their skin, and some of them at least are going to have lungs. The lungs, what's the swim bladder look like? It's just a sac. What does an amphibian lung look like? It's just a sac. Okay? What does your lung look like? A sac. Pardon? A sac. No, 
not even a little bit. How do I know that it's not like a sack? Because you've seen one. Yeah, but how do you know? Because I've seen one. Okay. Even if you've never seen one, how do you know that it can't be just a sack? If your lungs were just a sack, you would be sitting there as though you had COPD. You just couldn't get enough air. Because there wouldn't be enough surface area to support your metabolism. So it's like folds, the folds? It, it, in mammals, it's hyperfolded. Little pockets everywhere to maximize the surface area. In reptiles, there's some folding and pocketing and all of that, but not as much in mammals. All right? In amphibians, it's just a sac. In reptiles, it's folded and out-pocketed and things like that to increase surface area. In mammals, it takes that to the next extreme. So you have an amazing amount of surface area in your lungs, an order of magnitude more than you get in a reptile, which has an order of magnitude more than what you get in an amphibian. Okay? Now that presents a problem. So here's this amphibian, and it's bringing oxygen into the circulatory system through two different avenues. One is through its lungs, and the other is through the skin, and through the tongue, and the cheeks, and the lining of the throat, and all of that. So it has multiple avenues to get water, or to get air, into the circulatory system. Does that present a problem? It does. We'll bring that up in just a little bit. Okay, so we've already talked about that, that the adult forms have lungs, aquatic larvae, and uh, neotenic forms have gills. The lungs have these force pumps. If you look at a frog and how a frog breathes, they don't have diaphragms. Diaphragms are a mammalian invention. So what they're doing in order to force air into the lungs, they're using a buccal pump. So they're basically swallowing the air and forcing it down by contracting the musculature on the bottom of the throat. All right. Now we'll go back to getting air into the circulatory system when we talk about evolution of the heart. Let's talk about one more important thing, okay? And I want to talk about hearing. How do you hear sound? In your inner ear, what are the bones that, what happens? How do you, how do you manage to hear? The airwaves are coming to your eardrum, right? Your eardrum vibrates. What happens next? Yeah, but what, what bones are being moved? How many bones are there right behind the eardrum? There's the three of them. But the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, right? And those things are set up in a way to maximize the increased mechanical advantage. And they bang against the oval window. And the oval window is what sends the vibrations into the cochlea, okay? And then you have all of these sensory cells which are going to be picking up low frequency sound at one end, high frequency sound at the other end. All right? An amphibian does not have a malleosyncus and stapes. It just has one bone called the columella. So it has that columella, that single bone. And what that means is, here's the tympanic membrane, and there's the columella, and there's the oval window. So you have a one-to-one -one relationship between there and there. So it's a direct transferal of energy from the tympanic membrane to the oval window. But it turns out that they have two avenues of sound reception. And we know that because they have pairs of sensory papillae in the inner ear. So they have two transmission channels. Okay. 
and I want to show you what that looks like diagrammatically. So there is what it looks like. Here's the tympanic membrane. There's the columella, right? There's the oval window. And here's what happens. You have this basilar papillae right down here. And then you have the round window or the oval window, which is right there. And what ends up happening is this. You have this opercularis muscle right here, which is coming up from the shoulder girdle. And it's going right up to that inner ear. And what that means is that this animal is picking up vibrations from the ground through its skeleton. Those vibrations are transmitted up through the opercularis muscle from there to that sensory papillae. So you have airborne sound waves which are going that way, and then you have the groundborne sound waves which are going this way. One is picking up low frequency vibrations, the other is picking up high frequency vibrations. Have you ever gone to a concert, a rock concert, and you thought you had the good seats right there at the front on one side, right in front of that tower of speakers, and they start playing, and it's all awesome, but about three seconds into it, you're wishing you had brought some earplugs or something, and by the end of the concert, maybe three hours later, you can hardly hear anything. Your ears are just ringing. Ever had that experience? And yet the whole concert, even though your ears start, stopped working, you were still hearing everything, right? You were hearing all that sound through your skeleton. So you do exactly the same thing. The difference is you don't have that opercularis muscle, and you don't have that papilla amphibarium. You miss out on that. You just have the one pathway rather than two, and yet you are still able to pick up ground foreign sound waves. That's why you cannot sneak up on a snake, a lizard, or a frog. You're being really quiet, you're sneaking up on them, and they always jump away. They can't see you, but they hear your footsteps. They hear those ground foreign sound waves. Think about what that means. What that means is that for lizards and snakes and frogs and salamanders, they're just sitting there minding their own business. Every time they move, they hear their joints moving. Everything that's going through the ground, they hear. Okay? So they have those two avenues of sound. Low frequency through the ground, high frequency through the air. All right, we'll stop there and pick it up next time. I'll see you guys again on Thursday, Thursday at 1, not at 2. Is everybody all set with uh, Morpho J? Anybody need a little bit of help with it? Is that all we needed to do for Thursday 1? Yeah.